My name is Dr. Paul Coyer. I'm a research professor here at the Institute of World Politics. I was speaking to some of you earlier who had never heard of the Institute of World Politics, and it sounds like a think tank. So I have to say, it is not a think tank. We do do a lot of thinking here. It is not a think tank. We're a graduate school for foreign policy and national security. Uh, some of our grad students are here. You can talk to them later if you want to find out how they've enjoyed the experience. Um, but let's get to Venezuela. We, um, I, I first talked to David about coming here and speaking to you all about six months ago. At the time, we had hopes that some things might break, but of course, you never know. And in these sort of instances, you, you do never know until suddenly something happens. And we could see the January 10th date approaching. We had hopes. You know, we talked to Vanessa Neumann and Moises Rendon at CSIS about what the world could do to pressure Maduro uh, to, from the whole world to say that you're illegitimate after January 10th. And luckily, <coughs> that happened. Uh, the Trump administration pursued that line. A lot of other nations followed suit in quick order. And now uh, Maduro is in trouble. And so we are, uh, uh, many of us who have been watching Latin America for a while are quite obviously happy about this. Uh, my wife and I are busy talking on WhatsApp constantly to her friends and family in Venezuela. Uh, we have spent God knows how much money getting a lot of them out of the country over the last two years simply because sur daily survival was a problem. And I'm sure all of you that are here already know the basics of Venezuela, <coughs> that's why you're here, so I don't need to go into that. But, um, let me turn now to, to David Smolansky now. You probably noticed that Smolansky does not sound very Latino. That's because David's grandparents were originally from Ukraine. They were, they were Jews from Ukraine that, that left uh, Soviet Ukraine in 1927 when it was uh, under the rule of Joseph Stalin and uh, went to Cuba, uh, which despite the fact that it was under uh, uh, a dictatorship at the time, was uh, nevertheless thriving in many ways in, in the late 20s and the 30s. And, uh, and then found themselves again a generation later, the next generation of their family in the late 60s, having to leave Cuba again, their family business under pressure from, uh, from um, Castro's uh, Marxism, and went to Venezuela, which in the late 60s, all through the 70s, well into the 80s, was a thriving economy, a thriving polity. Uh, they had had a reinstitution of democracy there in 1958 with a coup which took place on January the 23rd, 1958. So, uh, Juan Guaido's uh, announcement on January 23rd that he was assuming power, that date was not chosen by accident. He didn't do it on, Jan on January the 10th or the 11th because he was waiting for that very important date, uh, which symbolized something very important to Venezuelan people with, with a sense of their own history. So anyway, David's family, it seems, is cursed to perpetually be, uh, be refugees. We hope that ends soon and that David can soon go back and help rebuild his country. Um, He's an amazing guy, some of you already know about him, but I'll read his bio with you really quickly. He was one of the founders of Voluntad Popular, a popular will, uh, back in 2009. He became the mayor of El Hatillo, a municipality in Caracas. Uh, he pursued policies there that uh, angered Maduro and openly criticized and opposed the regime, which led to them uh, putting out an arrest warrant for him, which led to him then spending, I believe, 35 days escaping, including hiking through the jungle to <coughs> Brazil, and then so made it here. He's now at Georgetown University. Um, he's officially been disqualified from any public administration role by Maduro, not that that matters to him that much. Um, he's one of the best known young Venezuelan politicians. Uh, he was actually the youngest elected mayor in Venezuela, I believe, correct, when you were there. Uh, his administration decreased kidnapping rates in El Hatillo, making the municipality one of the most secure and transparent in the country. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a founding member and Deputy General Sec Secretary General of Voluntad Popular. Uh, in 2015, he was recognized by, the, by Junior Chamber of International as one of the ten outstanding young persons in the whole world. I would say deservedly so. Mr. Solansky also received the Global Impact Award from Georgetown University last year. A journalism graduate from Universidad Católica Andrés Peo, he holds a master's degree in political science from the Universidad Simón Bolivar and participated in the Global Competitiveness Leadership Program at Georgetown University. First of all, he's just a good man that wants to see democracy reinstituted in his home country. Join me, please, in welcoming David Smolansky. Well, um, thank you very much, the Institute for World Politics, to for inviting me to, to this conference. When I was invited uh, a few months ago, the topic was how we can get hope 
in Venezuela, if you talk about only the migrants and refugees, is Maduro staying five, seven, or ten years more? Uh, what is the role of the National Assembly? There is lack of leadership. Well, now everything has changed, so everything that I prepared <laughs> almost um, didn't work for it. So, um, and, and this is my first conference in this uh, context so in Venezuela, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. First of all, I would like to start saying that uh, there is a new government in Venezuela. There is an interim president, and his name is Juan Guaidó. He is the head of state of Venezuela. He is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Uh, he's been recognized by almost 40 democracies in all over the world. The United States, Canada, Brazil, Colombia, Guatemala, Costa Rica, Panama, Argentina, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, uh, Kosovo, Georgia, the UK, England, uh, sorry, Germany, uh, France, Australia, Israel, uh, are recognizing Guaido as the interim president. This is something uh, unique. This is not, this is not uh, something that, uh, that um, well, at least in Venezuela, we have lived in, in the past. And this has been the consequence of an effort that we have been doing uh, for years. Uh, let me talk a, a little bit about Juan Guaidó. It's not always, you can say that I know the president since a long time ago. So I met Guaidó 12 years ago at Universidad Católica Andrés Bello, Catholic University of Caracas. Uh, he was studying engineering, I was studying journalism. And in 2007, the oldest TV station in Venezuela, Radio Caracas Televisión, was shut down by the regime in that moment by Hugo Chavez. So we decided as a students to go to the street uh, on a peaceful way, non-violent protest. We painted our hands in white on a sign of peace uh, protest to have uh, free media and to have uh, uh, free expression and to have uh, our human rights guaranteed. And in that moment, I met uh, Juan, <coughs> who is a very humble person. Uh, he was a survivor, literally survivor, of a natural catastrophe that we had in 1999 in Barca State, which is an hour away from, from Caracas, and thousands of people died because of, of huge rain that mountain uh, just what was there was a meltdown of the mountain for, for days. And um, and his part, as me as well, he's 35, I'm 33. We are part of a generation that has grown up in a country with no freedom with no security, with no democracy, with no rule of law, with no opportunities, and the most difficult thing, to be separated from our families. Because every day, there are Venezuelans saying goodbye to relatives, to friends, to neighbors, because they decided to flee, because there's no opportunities to work or study in Venezuela. So I think that's, even though it's very hard to put in words, when Chavez won, uh, I was 13 years old. Uh, I was in high school, and I remember as it was yesterday. And knowing the background of my family that you heard at the introduction, I knew that this, that in that moment, that something, that that thing was very bad for Venezuela and for the region, because having someone won an election that just six years before, in 1992, made a coup d'état, killing hundreds of innocent Venezuelans to get to power, uh, that's, that was not something that I wouldn't, that would have ruled, even though obviously with 13 years old I couldn't vote. And uh, Chavez probably was one of the masterminds of the modern dictatorship, that you use democratic institutions, that you use free and unfair elections, that you use <laughs> free media, that you use the rule of law to conquer power, and from power destroy those democratic institutions. And that's what happened in Venezuela. So you had in 1998 an election that was free, that was fair. You had a, 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 a independent public branches. You have a free, a free media. You have political parties that were legal. Anyone who wanted to run for president, they did it. And Chavez won, the majority elected. What we had in 2018, Maduro planned a fraud with an electoral council that is no neutral, it's controlled by the regime, with uh, main political leaders in exile or in jail, with political parties that have been illegalized, 
with media that is completely controlled. There's no free uh, media in, in Venezuela. So obviously, that's the, that's the thing that he has done to, to be in power. So even though we are part of that generation, this story of, of 20 years, probably um, it's been hard, but it's, it's the most powerful thing, thing that we have. Because we have been fighting through democratic ways to give our children, our grandchildren, <coughs> and the next generations a country that is completely different than the ones that we have grown up. We want, I want to give to my children a country with plenty of democracy. I want to give to my children a country with liberties. I want to give to my children a country that is not an option to flee because you will have opportunities to work and study. And I want to give to my children a country that you can have good news every day, every week, and not bad news that we have had. So fight for the things that you don't know is the most powerful uh, aspect of this generation. And I'm convinced that the transition in Venezuela has begun. And I am convinced that we are really, really close to restore democracy, to restore freedom. And the next step with that transition formalized is to call free and fair elections and let the majority of Venezuelans no matter if they live in Venezuela or if they live abroad, to choose to elect the next president. So this is a context that we're having. The way that we have done it is completely legal, is completely constitutional. The Article 233 of the Constitution, uh, I don't want to get in detail on the, on the internal thing in Venezuela, but the Article 233 of the Constitution is very clear when it says that, that when it's a vacancy of power on the executive branch, the, the Speaker of the House, the head of the Parliament, becomes the President, the interim President, the head of state. And that was, that's what Guaidó has done on a very, very brave way, and he's having the support of majority of the Venezuelans, and as I said before, he's having the support <coughs> of the majority of the international community. I'm talking about the international community. Um, I have had a few interviews just one before coming here. Is this a U.S. back coup d'etat? That's like a, always you, you. Sometimes you hear about it. This is not only the U.S. Obviously, the U.S. has played an important role. But this is not only the U.S. This is Georgia. This is Kosovo. This is Guatemala. This is Panama. This is Costa Rica. This is Chile. This is Argentina, Peru, Brazil, Colombia. There are some Canada. The European Union has given five days to Maduro to call free and fair elections that we don't have it, you're going to have 28 countries also recognizing Guaidó as the interim president. We started to listen on last Saturday in the Security Council to countries like Belgium or Poland, countries like Kuwait saying we need to discuss the situation in Venezuela, countries like Cote d'Ivoire in Africa expressing that they are concerned of the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. So this is something Worldwide, you can mention, worldwide. Uh, because the sooner we get democracy in Venezuela, the better for the region and the better for the world. Maduro has become not only a threat to Venezuelans, the Maduro's regime has become a threat to the region because Maduro, like Chavez, uh, has made of Venezuela <coughs> a safe heaven for illegal activities such as drug trafficking, illegal mining, gasoline trafficking, even human trafficking. A safe haven for irregular groups such as ELN. You saw two weeks ago the terrorist attack in Colombia, the one that was involved, lived in Venezuela in 2011, trained other ELN uh, people in Venezuela. So the thing that is going on in Venezuela is not only affecting Venezuelans, it's affecting the region. And also in the international context or in the political context or in the philosophical context, this is beyond ideological. This is not left wing, center, right wing. Venezuela have been kidnapped by a criminal structure. Venezuelans have been kidnapped by a mafia structure. And unfortunately, my country has become a criminal state, a mafia state. We don't want that, of course. But this is beyond ide ideology. You have countries with governments of right wing or left wing, 
recognizing Maduro as interim president. And they are clear that the things in Venezuela have gotten beyond uh, uh, ideology. So <coughs> when I say this, it's important because which is the context of Venezuela right now? Maybe a lot of you know already. Humanitarian crisis. At least half of Venezuelans cannot eat three, death, three, three times a day. Shortages of food and shortages of medicine in the country with the biggest oil reserve in the world, with the eighth biggest gas reserve in the world, with gold reserve, uh, and we have uh, this humanitarian crisis. Uh, this humanitarian crisis has created the biggest refugee and migration crisis ever in the region as we speak. 3.3 million of Venezuelans have fled the country against their will. There is 1.1 million of Venezuelans in Colombia. 700,000 Venezuelans in Peru. Um, uh, 250,000 Venezuelans in Ecuador. Even Aruba and Curaçao, that were used to receive Venezuelans for tourism, now between those islands, there are 40,000 Venezuelans refugees. In, in the United States, there are more than 500,000 Venezuelans. So, uh, I mean, the, the migration flow that the, the dictatorship has created is similar to countries that have had a war or that have had a natural catastrophe. So, if Venezuela gets the status of refugees, only Syria that has been in a war since 2011 would be above of Venezuela. Migration flows of Venezuela are uh, bigger at the moment than South Sudan, than Somalia, than Myanmar. Who would have thought that? Um, Venezuela for decades uh, was a country that received migrants, especially from Latin America. Uh, and I am part of that. I mean, my, my grandparents, uh, went to Venezuela with my father as a teenager because Venezuela in that moment was a country with plenty of opportunities and they suffered from a regime in Cuba. But there were other people that fled Central America because of an armed conflict. Also in Colombia, a lot of Colombians went to Venezuela, millions of Colombians went to Venezuela because of an armed conflict. Others went to Venezuela because they had dictatorship or they had hyperinflation. And now everything has changed and we're not receiving people were just having people fleeing uh, the country. So one of the things that I'm more optimistic about, and one of the things that really um, motivates me on the things that on, the, on, on, on this process that is going on, is just to think of Venezuelans reuniting with their family soon. I've seen so many students, for example, here in the United States, Venezuelans, that have the opportunity to go <coughs> to the US and study in the university. But I also have seen Venezuelans that are driving an Uber or are working on to very, very late in a restaurant because if they don't work on to very, very late in the restaurant, they cannot literally pay the rent of the apartment. And just to think all of them going back to Venezuela, taking a flight and giving a hug to their parents that they have not seen for years to their best friend have not seen for a, maybe a decade. Thinking of so many refugees in Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia that are in a very vulnerable situation, suffering from malnutrition, from diseases that were eradicated, and like malaria, diphtheria, just walking on that bridge that has become so famous between Cúcuta in Colombia and Tachi in Venezuela. But seeing those people walking on the bridge, not from Venezuela to Colombia, but from Colombia to Venezuela, and getting reunited with the family, I mean, I could not put that in words, and that will happen soon. I mean, when we restore completely democracy in Venezuela, that we're in that way, this will be not only a national celebration, this will be a worldwide celebration. You will see so many Venezuelans in Panama City, in Bogotá, in Santiago de Chile, in Miami, New York, in Madrid, in Barcelona, celebrating that we're having democracy and we can reunite with our family. And trust me, I'm mean, in touch with the president. We are very close to it. The only puzzle, the only piece of the puzzle that we need is the armed forces. And the armed forces, slowly, with the amnesty that the National Assembly has offered, are uh, 
giving steps to become loyal to the new um, commander in chief, who is Juan Guaido. Two examples the military attache of the Venezuelan embassy here in Washington, D.C., has already said that he resigned to the former president, to the dictatorship, Nicolas Maduro, and he now obeys interim president Juan Guaido. The police and soldiers that tried to detain President Juan Guaido two weeks ago, they released him after 50 minutes, saying, you are now the president. We will not obey Maduro anymore. You are our commander in chief. There are almost 200 soldiers in Venezuela, unfortunately, are in jail and are, are tortured because they have expressed our disagreements. Today, the consul of Venezuela in Miami, she has already expressed that she is obeying uh, interim president Guaido, and she's not obeying anymore Maduro. So you're going to see all those things happening during the next days, during the next weeks. And when we get the majority of the national on the armed forces, democracy and freedom in Venezuela will be restored. <coughs> we're going to have uh, we're going to have a, a transitional government, and we're going to call for free and fair elections. And after that, the most beautiful thing will start rebuilding the country. The policies that we need to reduce crime, the policies that we need to improve our health care system, the policies that we need to get our first world infrastructure, the policies that uh, we need to improve our diplomatic uh, uh, relations, the policies that we need to build trust and be an open market, a free market uh, country where we can reactivate our national economy but also people abroad or could invest in, in, in Venezuela not being expropriated. So all other things are coming to Venezuela. To have um, independent uh, uh, branches, we, to have a judiciary system that will not be promoting punity, will be prom prom promoting justice. Those are the things that are coming to Venezuela and I have seen so many young, young people committed to become uh, public servants. And our obsession on the public service not to be transparency. That was my obsession when I was mayor. Um, that was one of the first things that I did when I was a mayor is to, to sign a, an agreement with international transparency to be accountable because corruption has been the worst thing to Venezuela. It's been like a cancer that has made metastasis and all the institutions have been destroyed. And we need to have a government transparent and we need to have a government that is accountable and we need to have a government that is open to, to the people. And, uh, and we were committed uh, uh, to that. So um, during the, the, the next days are, are going to be crucial. Uh, interim President Guaido is uh, it's, uh, it's very focused on the scene, on the things that he's, he's doing. Uh, as I said, I've been in, in, in touch uh, with him. He has called for a rally. Uh, this Wednesday, he has called for another rally uh, this weekend. He has already appointed an ambassador to the OES. He has already appointed an ambassador to the White House. Uh, all those governments that have recognized interim president Juan Guaido, I'm sure that soon are going to have an ambassador that represent uh, his government. And with those, all those steps, at the end of the day, we're going to formalize uh, uh, that uh, uh, transition. So I've been in exile for 18 months. Uh, obviously, it's very difficult to be away from your country. It's, it's difficult to be away from your family. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's when you are in exile, you don't know when you go back to your country. But I have learned that uh, you cannot make that an obsession because if you uh, wake up every day thinking, when are you going back? You will not be uh, calm with yourself. So when this process for me started, I just read a lot of so many Venezuelan leaders in the past and Latin American leaders that went to exile and how, in, and how from exile uh, worked to restore democracy, like Fernando Enrique Cardoso in Brazil, like Ricardo Lagos in Chile, like Romulo Betancourt <coughs> in Venezuela. And I think that uh, every Venezuelan in these uh, in these uh, circumstances has uh, has given a lot. I mean, the main um, I mean here the uh, 
the most important, if you have to say the person of the year, as so many magazines do at the end of the year, has to be the Venezuelans. The Venezuelans who have not give up, given up. The Venezuelans who have been so restrict, resilient. The Venezuelans who have, you know, go to the streets and, and, and they have and they have faced tanks, tear gas, bullets, they have faced repression, jail, torture. They have faced immigration. And even though they're still firm and they're still fighting for a country that they have not enjoyed. So this is a, this is a achievement of the Venezuelans. The leaders have to be uh, very focused and very serious on the things that are coming. Uh, Maduro is completely <coughs> isolated. He's literally sleeping on the palace. If he's not in the palace, he's going to some of loyal generals that are still receiving him. He doesn't trust on anyone. Um, there are so many deflections that are coming, and uh, we are just giving him time to just leave the palace to restore democracy and freedom, and we are committed to rebuild our country. So thank you so much for inviting me. I would like to hear so many questions or comments for this, and it's been a real pleasure to be invited to do this conference, and especially in this historical time for Venezuela. Thank you. You just choose the question. You, you start. Okay. Um, yeah, I like the, your comment about the mafia. I read that recently that they, they created like a not necessarily an ideological class of rulers, but a corrupt mafia type class of rulers. And, and one thing I read that really surprised me, and I wonder perhaps you know, they said that the internal service had like tens of thousands of Cubans. I saw the number was like God, sixty or seventy thousand. Uh, Cubans actually make up their, the internal service, which obviously they're not going to switch over. Is, is there any truth to that number? It seems huge. Yeah. Well, it's a bit less than that. It's 40,000, which is not, <laughs> <laughs> it's not better. But yes, I mean, Cubans, Cubans are involved in this uh, dictatorship since its beginning. I mean, the first trip that Chavez did after he was released uh, was to Havana, and he made a speech at the University of Havana, and he expressed there the, his admiration to the Cuban Revolution and Fidel Castro and all of the great things that he has done for Latin America. So um, it's, it, it, it's funny for me when some journalists ask me, "For the U.S. is interest on the oil of Venezuela? We have been giving oil for free to Cuba for years. We have been giving gas for free to Russia for years." So, uh, no, <laughs> uh, 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 Cubans are, are really are deeply involved in this. Uh, it was an agreement, everything started with an agreement that Cubans, uh, the Cuban, uh, Castro sent to Venezuela, uh, teachers, doctors, nurses, and, and athletes in exchange of oil. A lot of these uh, were spy, another, and then, then he sent uh, agents. We have in the OES, this is very, very, um, uh, I don't know if the dangerous is the right word, delicado. Uh, uh, we have testimonies of Venezuelans that were, illegal, that were illegally detained and were tortured by Cubans in Venezuela. We have that in the OES. That's, uh, that's, that's something complicated. Recently, we, uh, there was a, uh, a regular article that said that, that Maduro is not only having uh, his security of uh, Cubans, but he's also uh, con uh, contracting uh, uh, Russian um, companies or security to, to, to his security. So uh, there's a clear involvement uh, from, from the Cubans, and, and this is something that we have to um, uh, take care of by the time that the transition uh, is built. Alcalde, I call you Mr. Mayor because you were uh, the kind of person that I hope will come back and govern in that wonderful country of yours. My godsons uh, 
in Solano, all his family. I used to go down there all the time. I'm a former U.S. diplomat, 30 years Kennedy to Chavez to, uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, all dictatorships, including two years in Havana, Cuba. So I do understand how they do that. And I would like to be as optimistic as you are, but fingers crossed. I have two comments that I think are very important. Everybody in the world is focused on your wonderful country now. So it's all written up and I have all the clippings and I read rather than do other work. And there's one concept that I think has to be emphasized and perhaps it's not emphasized enough. What do you do with nasty sons of bitches dictators? You hang them? No, rule of law, because we believe in law, don't we? I don't. Because there's a guy in the White House that doesn't pay his bills and sues people. You do what we used to do in my day. You send somebody into exile, because you want them to go away and not punish your wonderful people and ruin your wonderful country. So when you talk and when everybody else writes up the things, amnesty, 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 to get the sons of guns out of the place so all of you and all of you can make Venezuela the wonderful country that it almost was. There's some problems before that. The other thing I would emphasize is, yes, I'm a former Yankee political officer. I'm in the swamp now, but I still work on Cuba, Paraguay, Brazil, and Venezuela. Don't let the Yankees, and I'm a great Yankee imperialist, don't let the Yankees get too visible. Squeeze people that need to be squeezed, talk to people that need to be talked, help you, use AID money to bag somebody, but don't let noisy people, I'm not going to say who's noisy, let noisy people take care of their problems here in the United States of America. And use subtle people to work professionally with all of your people and all of these wonderful people around the world that wants to have wonderful things happen. Because you don't want the people that mouth around saying, oh, sovereign countries should take care of their own sovereign stuff. Yankee imperialists shouldn't mess around, let other people do this. No, we want to be involved and help, but don't let people push back and call us imperialists. And then the optimistic thing that you want and do will come to pass. Thank you. Well, uh, starting from your second comment, um, <clears throat> as I said on, on, my, on my, my words, um, this is a multilateral I think that's the, has been the key of this uh, international strategy. It's the U.S., yes, and they have played an important role, and, uh, and we appreciate that the U.S. is committed to democracy and freedom in Venezuela, but also it's Canada, it's Costa Rica, it's Guatemala, it's Panama, it's Honduras, it's Colombia, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, <coughs> Chile, Argentina, Paraguay, Paraguay St. Lucia in the Caribbean, the European Union, uh, Australia, Israel, Kosovo, Georgia, and I could say more. Um, so it's been a worldwide effort to restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela because everyone is concerned, <coughs> um, everyone is suffering when you see so many kids that are, uh, you know, have been victims of malnutrition, uh, people that have literally died because they kind of find a medicine in the hospital or in a pharmacy. Um, when you see so many people that have been victims of crime, like the last 20 years, more than 330,000 people have been killed in Venezuela because of crime. And this is because you have a regime that promotes impunity, more than 90% of impunity. So, one of the things that I, that we'll see in the future is so many countries respecting, of course, our sovereignty, but helping to rebuild uh, Venezuela. And with the first question, um, the regime has been given an amnesty for a week. So, 
don't know how to say this, I'll try to say this in English, but the, 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 the same Spanish that Pelota está en su cancha, so the ball is in its court now. They have the amnesty to, to decide. An amnesty, an amnesty, an amnesty, yeah. an amnesty, an amnesty, an amnesty, an amnesty doesn't mean impunity because we're going to have justice, but the ball is in its court. Uh, go ahead. Could you speak to the possibility that if Maduro does go, that other corrupt actors or another illegitimate election or those type of possibilities not not transitioning directly into right? So you, what you, you you meant is that uh, someone from Chavismo. So, uh, uh, I, I, I don't see it. I see that, 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 that if that scenario happens, uh, we have studied, uh, it, would, it, would, it would get the things even worse because we have already have an interim president that has been recognized by the people, has been recognized by the international community, and he's already acting as a president. So, uh, I think that that situation will get the things uh, even worse, and, uh, and, uh, and, and Majority of armed forces will not will not permit. Go ahead. Where is Diaz Dado Cabello in all this? And how many hundreds? Of, how many? A follow up to that about the mafia narco state. What is your estimate on how much money has been stolen? Is it more than a hundred billion? More than two hundred billion. It is estimated. Okay. It's probably the biggest. Robbery and uh, yeah. modern. But what about El Diablo? What are you going to do with him? <laughs> the wall is a big court as well. <coughs> Amnesty is not the same as impunity. Um, yeah. Hi. First and foremost, gracias por todo lo que has hecho por el país, por lo que continúas haciendo. Sorry, I had to say that in Spanish. Um, <laughs> but, um, my question is, how would you go about calling open, free, and fair elections in Venezuela, the current Consejo Nacional Electoral? Would you first have to purge it? Is that what you guys are planning on doing, or how you go about it? That is a very, very good question. Thank you for, for bringing that to the discussion. So the, the directors of the Electoral Council are appointed by the National Assembly. So as soon as we get the transitional uh, government, uh, under interim president Juan Guaido, the National Assembly has to appoint, has to appoint uh, five new uh, directors, members of the Electoral Council. Obviously, with you know all the credentials and all the all the things that you need to be in that position to guarantee and free and fair elections. So that will change as soon as we get the transition formalized 100. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the first step, and then you call for free and fair election. Because the free and fair elections is not called by the president, or it's not even called by the National Assembly. It has to be called by the Electoral Council. And in that moment, you will have five new different players there. Um, after the transition is complete and democracy is restored in Venezuela, what are the chances that Venezuela would take back its recognition of the Russian occupied territories of Abkhazia and South Ossetia? A lot of chance. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> no one. <coughs> I mean, there are just four or five governments that uh, recognize South Ossetia as a as a part of uh, Russia, and uh, we are with the people of Georgia that were uh, victims of that uh, invasion in 2008 by the Russian Federation. So uh, there is a commitment of the new government to uh, stand with the Georgian people. Uh, who condemned what happened in 2008, and this is what, and, and that recognition that Chavez gave. It was not on behalf of the majority of Venezuelans. Here, and then here. Um, something that you emphasize is uh, the big migration crisis that uh, the situation Venezuela has has created. Um, as a Venezuelan outside, hasn't been back in five years. Following uh, what has been what has been happening from eight years, especially uh, right now, in this crucial point that the country is going through. Um, with that said, um, seeing all the people act back home, protesting and risking their lives, I think something that others could agree on, especially Venezuelans outside of the country, is that we get frustrated because 
you we often think that there's not much it, that we can do being so far from home. Um, so my question to you is, what do you think is the role, or what can we as Venezuelans outside do <coughs> to help our families and to help those of those that we know back home that are fighting? What can we do to help this process? Well, first of all, I hope that those five years will end soon, so you can go back to, to your country and see your relative <coughs> in your homeland. And I think the role of the diaspora is, is crucial on the rebuilding of the country. There are so many uh, Venezuelans that have had the opportunities to, to, to go to great universities uh, abroad, to have important uh, positions on the private sectors of being entrepreneurial. And all those skills, I hope uh, that they could share it with in, on this rebuilding process, uh, um, if they decide to go back, you are more than welcome, of course, to go back, because uh, every Venezuelan is the same, no matter you're in Caracas or you're in Washington. And also, I think we need to go in a process of capacity building. We need to do a capacity building to so many people on different areas, because there's been 20 years of, of corruption and destruction. So I think uh, to have people abroad that could help on that and, and are willing to, 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 to do entrepreneur in Venezuela and to get involved in the, in the, in the public sector, uh, it, will be, it will be crucial. And of course, we need to understand there will be a lot of Venezuelans that they will not go back. That's, that's, that's something that highly probable to happen. You will have millions that say, OK, I'll go back to Venezuela. And others will say, you know what? I mean, I will not go back. But how you? How you link those Venezuela who decide to stay abroad to the rebuilding of the country is one of the things that we're going to discuss on, on in the near future. Yes, uh, hope you have, I answer your question. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Beatrice. I work for a private sector company. Um, I wanted to ask you: um, you mentioned <coughs> the government of Juan Guaido has already appointed representatives in the White House, in the Organization of American States. What is the foreign policy strategy? Uh, what are the priorities uh, right now? The United States offered very recently humanitarian aid, so I don't know if that's one of the things you're trying to prioritize. Um, yes, I mean, well, as the rebuilding is not only happening in the nation, but also the diplomacy uh, transition is where, where's we're, we're having it, and uh, I was uh, I lived, I have lived that very closely. Most recently, two days ago, when we went to the United Nations Security Council, where for the first time Venezuela was discussed. And then, then the priority now for for um, on this in, on this uh, diplomatic agenda, this new diplomatic agenda, is to have the humanitarian assistance, so we can get tons of tons of medicine and, and food inside the country. Also, we like to have ambassadors on the different countries of, uh, with governments that have recognized interim president uh, Juan Guaido. Um, you, you, also, we will be calling for free and fair uh, elections. So when, as soon as we get, as soon as the free and fair elections are called, we would like to have neutral <coughs> international uh, observadores uh, on, on that process. So those are the things that we have started to work. Yes. And also, sorry to, 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 sorry to say, and also uh, discuss policies with the countries that have the biggest uh, Venezuelans, migrants, and refugees to policies to protect and give, and, 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 and to, to give protection and attention to them. <laughs> on, on, on healthcare, food, education, legal assistance, uh, actions against uh, xenophobia and capacity building. David, hi, Eric Barnes for the Council of Americans. Um, first of all, congratulations on your courage, your personal courage, uh, and also in your efforts to organize the opposition. For so long, many critics who one wonders what their actual orientation really is for the government of the past have used the idea that the opposition is divided as a reason not to support, uh, but now clearly with one way the opposition is clearly unified. So 
Thank you for that. Thank you for the leadership efforts. Thank you, Eric. It's been an effort for so many people, not only me. Well, it's a group effort, but really making some risks. Thank you so much. The question I have is you saw, of course, the announcement just a few minutes ago from the White House about sanctions on their base. This is huge, mm -hmm. dramatic stuff. You are giving me that breaking news. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the National Security Advisor and the Treasury Secretary both announced that. My question is. And it goes along with uh, Tim Towles' implication of his question, so that this does not become a U.S. Venezuela issue, but rather a broader international <coughs> issue. You anticipate steps, for example, from the Brazilians, from Europe, uh, from certain countries in Asia like Japan, Canada, to follow up these steps. They don't have the same relationship on the American side to the Bay side. I understand that. But do you, under do you anticipate? them to follow up quickly with additional steps to continue to make this a truly multilateral Yeah, very good question. And it has been done like that. Um, it's, it, it started with, with, with the recognition of Guaido as the interim president, and we're going to see in the next days more government, more governments of the world recognizing Guaido as the interim president. Then you, you're going to see how uh, uh, those governments will accept an ambassador uh, uh, appointed by President Guaido and authorized by the by the National Assembly. Also, uh, we, we have been talking to to governments of the world to limit the the the, the, the travels basically of these high officials that have been involved in in, in illegal activities, uh, have been involved in, in corruption, have been involved in, in, in human rights. Um, so and and. And, and I think it's very important what will happen in Europe in five days, really important. Uh, don't be surprised if you see so many Venezuelans rallying during the weekend, especially in Spain. Um, so yes, it's a global, uh, it's a global effort. And, and, and we need to understand that I mean, for decades, the US and Venezuela have very close ties. And, and, and that's not bad. I mean, we have also close ties with so many other countries, I mean, so many uh, uh, Spaniards and Portuguese and Italians went to Venezuela and they did great things for for, for my country. So uh, even though sometimes uh, when the, the things that the US uh, uh, does is more in the media than in other countries, it's a, it's a global uh, uh, effort. Yeah, so. But we need to understand that we are in a geopolitical uh, battle as well. And I saw it very clearly in the Security Council. For me it was uh, Quite of experience to be there. Uh, I've been in the United Nations before, but never in the Security Council, I have to confess. But the first time that Venezuela was discussed as Security Council, and to see Russia defending Venezuela like it was like a neighbor country, uh, it was a geopolitical, we're in a geopolitical uh, battlefield. Fortunately, the majority of democracies are with, with Venezuela. We were talking a little bit about humanitarian assistance, particularly within Venezuela. Can you comment on the possibility of that, particularly at this point in time, enabling the regime? Rather than well, we'd like to have that as soon as possible. All the details and logistics that we are planning, uh, we're planning it. <laughs> and we'll give, we'll give some details during the next uh, days. Uh, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to get, we'd like to get a lot of governments involved on this very important assistance that people are expecting in, in Venezuela and, uh, and, and, and you'll hear a lot about it in the next, in the next day. Do you think it would assist the regime in being able to hold on longer? Just... It was a breaking point for, for some soldiers. If they allowed the food and medicine for, their, for our citizens, even for, for their families, or are they going to block? So, Maduro has always said that the U.S. has blocked uh, uh, its economy. Well, you'll see there if they, if, if, if they are not allowed, the, if they do not allow uh, the food and medicine to get in Venezuela. It's the clearest evidence that the ones that have blocked our people for food and medicine is the is the, the regime. Uh, yeah. So you were you were. So I, I have some questions about the. European Union resolution for that in Venezuela. Um, it's not very clear. As, as an Spaniard, I don't really think I'm very impressed with what the UN, what the European Union has said about Venezuela, giving five days 
and they are not addressing the president of Venezuela, but they are addressing that comment to Maduro. So I, I think that many things can go wrong about that. And you are very, you think that in this way, <coughs> even Venezuelans in Spain are going to be very happy, but then you think that there's also many risks on that declaration? In what sense you you see risks? Sorry to understand. In the sense that, to my understanding, the European Union is asking Maduro to have new elections, right? And Maduro could also say, hey, okay, let's have new elections. And Maduro considers himself the legit president of Venezuela, uh, unlike, unlike many of us here. Uh, and they could be not free or, or prolong the situation. Exactly. Well, I mean, uh, we'll, as far as we understand, we, we will listen a strong statement from the European Union by Friday or Saturday. Weekend. In the European Union, it was also playing an interesting game to say to Maduro, well, you've been, you've been offering a, the regime has been offering an amnesty. We've, we've been proposing here to you to have free and fair elections. Um, so if you don't, if you don't even answer to that, who recognizes Guaido as interim president? And I and I thought that the thing that you were saying, Arriaza, what well, I thought that Arriaza was about to say that in the Security Council because he had Belgium, he had Poland. He had the UK, he had France, he had opportunity there to speak to four <coughs> European countries and say, okay, we will take your proposal, we'll think about it. And he said, why, why, why are you threatening us? Why, 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 why is Europe giving uh, eight days to Venezuela? You don't give us a deadline. And also Russia said the same. And Diosdado Cabello, at the same time, was saying that in a meeting, in, 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 in a rally in, in Venezuela. So. Uh, again, this is a worldwide effort, and what I love about all the things that's going on is that you see different strategies, but different strategies with the same objective, to restore democracy and freedom in Venezuela. For example, I, I am a great defender uh, of the Lima Group declaration on January 4th. That was fantastic. I had, I had made disagreements on the Guyana uh, uh, statement, on the mine, in what I think was Article 9. But the Lima Group, that statement on January 4th, when, we, when in the future, when we read about uh, history in Venezuela and how we restore democracy, that document has to be in the books. Because that document was something that encourages so many people in my country and, and, and encourages Congress. And was Latin American countries. So it was, there, was, there were times that Latin American countries said, oh, we don't get involved in other situations. And you saw here a group of 13 countries say, no, Venezuela is important for the region. Question regarding, so you talked a little about the economic and political policy that the opposition wants to kind of carry forward of the current <coughs> president. Um, I was wondering if you'd speak a little bit to the theme of political polarization in the country, how the opposition intends to address that. Because I think even I visited years ago, I already sensed that there was an incredible amount of divisiveness between Chavistas and the opposition. And obviously, I imagine there's still some elements of that in the country. So, how are you planning to kind of approach that? Um, well, you know, you know, that question. Uh, would have been, um, if you asked me that in 2012 or 13, you say it will be a challenge, of course, to have a polarized country 50 50. But now it's not like that. I mean, Venezuelans are not polarized. Um, it's just a criminal structure going against a whole population. I have, I have said to many officials on the international community, please have a situation room and night because the regime is killing Venezuelans every night. I mean, at, at least 30 people have been killed during the last five days because they've been protesting at night. Uh, by the way, the people that are protesting are the ones who live on the more, the most uh, rural areas, on the most uh, 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 poor neighbors of, of, of Venezuela. And they have been persecuted by, by brigades that the regime created to go against them and they go to their to their houses and everything. So <coughs> as I said, when 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 Maduro stepped down, uh, you'll see a worldwide celebration and you'll see a country completely reunited. Um, with the new presidency, how do you see relationships with governments that continue to back in the world changing um, under the new regime, especially with China, which has um, over the past decade or so, given tens of billions of 
Well, that's a very good question. Uh, the new government wants to have the best relations with every government in the world. And, uh, and with, specifically with the case of China, there is a debt of more than 20 uh, billion. And uh, I think there is an opportunity <coughs> to um, uh, talk and rene renegotiate uh, this case of, of, the, of, the, of the debt. Uh, and, 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 and President Guaido is open to, to, to work with, uh, with every government in the world as soon as they respect uh, sovereignty, which is it's funny when, when Maduro says, no, uh, 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 there is an intervention, uh, the, our sovereignty is in risk. I mean, Maduro and, and Chavez gave our sovereignty to other interests. So, and I think all the things that you do with the international community has to be through legal ways, uh, have to be transparent. Yes, so it's our interest too. I don't see it. I mean, I, Maduro is, it's, uh, I think the strategy of Maduro is the, is the worst, if I were his shoes. I mean, uh, he's, uh, he's allowing the new government to have, not quick wins, to have the quickest win ever. You're having, every day having a, a, a win on this. You're having a country liberalizing Guaido, you're having an ambassador to be appointed. I mean, when you, when you have a country that is so destroyed, <coughs> everything that you do right is fantastic. I mean, because you're not in a conventional system. So uh, you will see those quick, 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 quick wins, wins, and he'll be completely isolated. I don't think he has any chance to, to, to maintain. If it will happen in a week, in two weeks, in a month, that will depend, at the end of the day, on the majority of the armed forces that they are giving the step. And, and we need them to... to Keep active on that. Anybody else? Is there any possibility of violent corruption in the country if the armed forces don't? Um... Well, there is violence already. At least 30 people have been killed in the last five days. People that have been protesting peacefully, especially at, at, at night. Uh, there's been very, uh, you know, uh, interesting soci sociologically thing. Uh, because there are people protesting at night, trying to not be identified, uh, and they are doing have done it non-violent, peacefully way, and and already you have had violence of, of almost 30 people have been killed. So there's already violence in, in Venezuela promoted by 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 the regime. Yeah, I don't know if I answer your question, but uh, that's the violence that we that we have, and, and 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 don't don't forget the crime rate in Venezuela. There is a homicide rate of 70 per 100,000. So every day, Venezuelans are killed because of crime. Just last year, 23,000 Venezuelans were killed because of crime. That has not disappeared, unfortunately. Go ahead. What do you see happening to the uh, foreign assets that were nationalized under the previous regime? Will it go back to the, those people, or is the country going to take it? What do you see happening? Well, that, that's uh, something that, uh, that, uh, that I, will, I would like to start talking about it. It's a decision of the interim president, of, of the new president. Of course, there are so many things, so many <coughs> companies and business and, and industry that were illegally nationalized, expropriated, literally robbed, that uh, needs to be given to the original owner or, or needs to go to a, I'm not sorry to about my English, to go to a visit, visitation, just to go to an open com, com, contract uh, process, uh, um, go private again, those things will be discussed in the, in the near, in the near uh, future. But definitely, I mean, we, we cannot have a state that has 3,500,000 <coughs> employees. You have a president that only appoints 13,000 people. <laughs> uh, you, you, you just need to, to start changing things if you want to, to develop the country as soon as possible. Okay, we're getting close to our end of our time together. Let's thank David for coming and... Uh...